Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It's um, very exciting to be here. It's um, a wonderful group. It looks like a full house, which is fantastic, but I think Michael gets full houses everywhere he goes, so that's not unusual. Um, as Michael mentioned before, I'm a documentary filmmaker generally, so this was a quite a new experience for me to, to write a biography. But I've made many films, really, that are biographical films and written all the scripts, so it's not that different. And I've always enjoyed that. It's an incredible thing to tell the story of someone's life. And the book actually attempts to do that in a way that's a bit similar to the films that I've made, in that I've tried to foreground the voice of the character's the prominent characters in the book in the same way that a documentary might have the talking heads of the of the characters. Um, so interviews with Michael and members of his family and so on, and in particular his partner Johan, who hadn't spoken certainly on film before I did that interview with him, and I've used that extensively in the book, and it really provides a really interesting and unusual um, view of Michael's life, which hasn't um, really been published before. But the other very important thing in this book that isn't anywhere else um, is a series of materials that I was lucky enough to get um, late last year when Michael Kirby's father, Don Kirby, died um, tragically and he left a huge archive of materials about his son which went to Michael's chambers and Michael rang me up one day and said, do you want to come down and have a look at this material? And I raced down there and as a biographer that was just the sort of phone call you want to get really. Um, it was an absolutely incredible treasure trove of materials and I zoned straight into um, some aged letters that were wrapped up in Michael's beautiful um, handwriting in his blue fountain pen, um, letters between himself and his father and letters from his father and his mother back to him at the very moment uh, in his life when he had decided that he was going to um, have love in his life and he had to find a way that he could do that and that was about the age of about 29. Um, so the book contains this correspondence and it's it's um, you know wonderful material and it was incredible for me to actually as a biographer be able to access that which really was sort of um, missing material in a way in Michael's life. I don't think he can talk about this and we'll talk about it later but I don't think he'd seen these letters for many years. And I found other materials as well and one thing that I just might read out uh, to start off is this wonderful description of Michael that I found written by his mother. Um, and it says MDK, this was written when he was about 22. It says, MDK, born under seven, religious, superstitious, highly strung. This is very important to his life. 22 years old, 1961, lucky person, flamboyant, interested in music, theatre, art. Too many interests, not enough application to any one thing. If he implies, <laughs> applies himself to one thing, much better than spread out. Very liked person, ability in social situations, bit of a loner, very authoritarian, sensitive to the point of weakness, very lucky person, ability in the arts, found life and opportunity coming his way when he needs it, nevertheless uses opportunities to his advantage, very thorough in work, sometimes in life difficulties to cope with, but generally he will cope. He puts importance on sensuality, but he is not fond of children of his own. <laughs> Religious, he expects anything or nothing from enterprises. Highly spiritual, highly developed person, nervous tension, up and down personality, and very fair in dealings. So, Michael, if we turn to your early life and your family life, maybe one of the first questions I'd have is, is that an accurate assessment from your mother? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it does show my mother's um, 
perception. I mean, she was such an intelligent person, but very different to my father. My father was more reserved. Um, my mother was intuitive. My father was sort of lineal and uh, logical. My mother saw the whole picture and uh, between the two of them, they were very wonderful parents. And my father died last November, and that was a tragedy, but he didn't die tragically in the sense that he didn't have an accident, he died in hospital, and uh, it, uh, it's a big loss. Uh, Noel Coward once said, it's a terrible thing to be an orphan at 82 or something. <laughs> and I feel, you know, having lost my father last year, my mother died uh, 10 years before, um, it's a strange thing how you feel every day, oh, I must ring Dad and tell him that, and uh, then suddenly you realise you can't do that. So um, my mother's assessment is pretty accurate and my parents were wonderful. I was blessed with terrific parents, wonderful siblings, uh, and a magnificent partner um, who's very skeptical skeptic about this whole enterprise and uh, the publicity and so on. He thinks it's all a little bit vulgar. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, so that's the package. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. What is your, your book is written like a series of, of film, scenes and uh, it's very interesting and the use of the materials which became available and which are still becoming available, my brother is still finding stuff, uh, is uh, very well done, mm. if I can say so. Thank very you. well done. <laughs> so what did you think when you saw those letters between yourself and your parents? again after all those years? Well, I dimly remembered them, um, mm. but um, I, don't, I can't quite work out how my father got the letters because they were letters to me. I must have somehow left them or entrusted them to him, or, but they were all there. I mean, he had a tremendous collection. He kept everything. Uh, and so they were all there and uh, available. My brother Donald, um, uh, who is continuing to sort out the papers, um, found a wonderful letter which my father sent to Johan in 1973, uh, which I'd, I'd never seen before, and I only saw this week, mm. which um, thanked Johan for sending uh, um, uh, a letter to them in 1973. We were then both in the Netherlands and he's, he wrote to him and said, Jan, you are such a kind person. Our wayward children never write to us, but you've written to us and thank you for telling us. We just had a terrible day. All the trains in Sydney were down and we were locked in tunnels and it was horrible, but we came home and there was your letter and uh, Mrs. Kirby, as he called my mother at that stage, was extremely grateful to receive receive the letter. They broke down those formalities soon after that, but um, that's how it was in those times. Well, Johan and you must have really clicked when you first met, almost, because I've also got letters in here from both you and Johan, written from uh, London and Johan from uh, the Netherlands, in about in the early 70s, in 1970, I think, back to your parents. And Johan actually knows what you're writing in your letter, even though you're in separate countries, and he talks about that. It's quite extraordinary. You're written within a few hours, I think. But Yes, um, but I don't want to be, uh, and you bring this out in the book, I don't want to be deceptive about this. I had, before I met Johan, uh, a lover who was, in fact, my first... Uh, who was Demo, a Spaniard. And we still uh, keep touch with him uh, all these years later, uh, 40, 44 years later. And uh, I, I think you're one's first, um, first lover and friend, whoever you are, straight mm -hmm. or gay, is a very important person in your life. It's the first time that aspect of your life has been revealed to another human being and they to you and so on. And so uh, I was still sort of searching for that relationship whilst 
uh, enjoying the relationship with Jan and you, you mention all this and you reveal how hurtful that was to Jan at the time. Mm. Um, but ultimately I came to realise how lucky I was to have uh, a partner like Jan. He, he is a stalwart, strong, uh, faithful, supportive, and everybody in life, if possible, should have that sort of love. And um, uh, so an aspect of your book, this is the first book that has a photograph of Demophilo, mm. uh, and it's the first one that reveals about that uh, relationship, which is not all that different. Uh, in fact, you know, it was a pretty late start at the age of 28, uh, and uh, to be, as it were, exploring that aspect of your life. You know, there are some people in this world and some people in our country who don't approve of that type of relationship and think you should just be celibate. Well, we've got to tell these people, get real and also get kind. It's a very cruel thing. Last week was a very disappointing week, very disappointing to me, very disappointing to many citizens, straight and gay, that our parliament in this day and age defeated so overwhelmingly what should be a very simple step for us to take that other countries uh, like uh, Catholic Spain, Catholic Argentina, Catholic Portugal and other countries of Europe and North America have taken, but it was just a bridge too far for us by a very big vote. Well, I want as a citizen to say that was extremely hurtful and very wrong and I refuse to accept a disrespect for my relationship and for the relationship of others, fellow citizens. I hope it will be repaired very quickly. But you, uh, throughout your life you've seen things change enormously, nevertheless. Um, if you go back to your early life um, in the 1950s, things were very different. I mean, I oh, was... Oh, yes, very different. Uh, our country then. I mean, I was thinking about it today because this morning I had to give a talk to the law students at the University of Queensland in Brisbane and I was thinking about how monochrome... And really, that was the, that was the trick. Uh, the idea was to, to make us all the same. You couldn't be a communist. Communists were going to be banned. You couldn't be an Aboriginal. Aboriginals were disrespected and they had no land rights and basically they should just disappear. You couldn't be an Asian because Asians defied the white Australia policy. You couldn't come in as an Asian. And you, even if you married overseas, you couldn't bring your spouse back. Women had very low legal rights. A woman's domicile was dependent on the domicile of the, the husband. Uh, and you know, none of us as law students, and I told these kids this morning, none of us uh, ever put our hand up and asked why was that so. Gays were locked up and, and criminalised. And we as law students never asked about it. We just all accepted these things. And that was an attempt to make a monochrome society with the infantile principle that everybody had to be the same. Well, we've changed a bit. There are, you can be a communist if you're so old fashioned. You can be uh, uh, Aboriginal rights to some extent have been respected. Asians are now a very important, prominent part. But if they come on boats, they're not welcome. And our obligations under the Refugees Convention are farmed out to other countries, which can't be in accordance with the convention. And gays, well, so long as they're only asking for money or civil rights, that's OK. But for dignity and for equal respect, well, we don't really want to go there. And this is... We're on the journey, but let's not get too self-congratulatory. There are still a lot of steps to be taken. Mm. So when you, you began your law degree and then you went into practice, well, <coughs> What did you do about the situation you faced with your own personal life versus the law and the way the society of the time saw you? Well, I joined the Council for Civil Liberties 
Uh, everybody should be a joiner. I mean, the, the benefits of being a citizen of this country is that we can join bodies and stir things up and try to make things better. And so I'd seen that the attempt to ban the communists because my grandmother had married a, a, a second time and she'd married the national treasurer of the Communist Party. So that sort of gave me an insight into that form of, uh, of uh, denigration. And then I, I became involved in the Council for Civil Liberties for people who were objecting to the Vietnam War. Mm. It was very hard to get conscientious objection under the National Service Act. And we had m many fights, all pro bono, for those people. And then uh, the Vietnam War came along and, and uh, many, f many fights for students who were being arrested outside the American consulate protesting against the Vietnam War. And so I started to do things. And, and that's what we all have to do. And did a lot of it pro bono. And I told these students this morning, not only was that interesting, some of it was even fun, but it was also, it got me noticed. Mm. People started to say, who is this troublemaker? Eric Bohm, does anyone in the audience remember Eric Bohm? He was, he was sort of like the Piers Ackerman of his day. <laughs> and he used to attack me and, uh, and so, that sort of was was good for me and good for the... For, but I was doing it because I, I wanted to try and make Australia a better place. And lots of people were doing that then. And I think that's how I got involved in activities trying to improve the country. I don't want to exaggerate my role. My role was minuscule, but it was part of the role of, of endeavours by uh, leaders, intellectual leaders in the country to try to change things. It was an interesting time too, wasn't it, then in the 60s at Sydney Uni where it you was. were? And uh, overseas, of course, it was a very big time in Europe. Uh, it, first of all, and in America, it was flowers in the hair in America. And in Europe, it was the sort of revolution of uh, 1968. Mm. And uh, uh, so it was a big time here. Well, we had a sort of mini revolution. It wouldn't even be called a revolution. It was type of a stir up. And uh, so we started to um, improve and change things. And uh, I think that a lot of change happened during the Whitlam government mm. and during the Fraser government. Mr Fraser did a lot of uh, very important changes to make public servants more accountable and to establish uh, bodies like the Human Rights Commission and so on. So. Um, they were quite, they were golden years really and uh, a lot, there was a lot of consensus in federal politics. You can't say there's a lot of consensus in federal politics today. But during that time you did, you had to maintain your own private life as a sort of a secret, a semi-secret, didn't you? Well, that's how it was in those days. It was don't, don't ask, don't tell. You, you were expected to um, be totally silent about it and to keep it all to yourself. Um, and, and in a way, this was all pandering to what I've called the monochrome, infantile attitude that everybody had to be the same. It was okay. People knew there were gays out there. Those people, they're out there. But they didn't want to be made to think about it. And um, we've now got to the point that they've got to think about it. And more and more people are saying, well, this is how it is and get used to it. It's not going to disappear and, uh, and stop disrespecting other citizens. So you, you were quiet because that was, they were the rules. If you, if you were quiet, you were left alone. Mm. Uh, but fortunately, I met first of all Demofilo, and then he left me after I took him to New Zealand, which was a terrible shock. It cost me so much money that trip. <laughs> and then, uh, within two weeks, I met Yoan. And you know, I've had some gay people say to me, I've been going to pubs for years, and you meet these two gorgeous guys within a matter of two weeks of each other, and it's unfair. It's unfair that you did so, you had such good fortune, but I certainly did. And Johan says um, you were all so handsome back then, and then he waits a moment and says, what, what happened? <laughs> 
yeah, well, Jan was a really good looker, as was Demo. I mean, uh, <laughs> they were, they, but they were both very, very interesting people. Demophilo was much more Spanish and volatile and so on. Jan is a sea of calm. He is strong, uh, he is calm, he is logical, he is practical. Uh, all of which I only have in smaller doses. <laughs> he, he has been able to add those qualities to my life through our relationship. The t two important things, obviously, in your life are, are your family, but also um, your religion. Both, in different ways, reacted... Well, there were, there were reactions in terms of you coming out as gay or not so much coming out but how you dealt with that at that early time in the 1960s I mean why I mean how did you reconcile your Anglican faith with your sexuality at that I time? never had any problem I mean I, I knew that that was just me and if that was just me and it was other people too then that was part of the grand design and whether you were religious or not uh, if, if you're religious, you thought, well, that's part of God's design. If you're not religious, you say, well, that's just part of nature's design, as it is. Uh, and in fact, there, there are theories and there are, is analysis about why a certain proportion of human beings and of other animal species, all animal species, uh, are uh, same-sex attracted. And it's just, uh, it's, it's probably in order to make sure that some people are not, as it were, focused only upon a, 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 a small family group, but have a wider focus of mm. commitment and interest to uh, the society or the flock. And uh, I think that's what's the, the, the situation in my case. But again, I wouldn't want to exaggerate. I mean, I feel a bit awkward about this talk about my religion. I grew up as an Anglican. I went to the local Anglican church. I sang in the choir. I attended the things. I was confirmed. I have some good friends in the Anglican church. I respect uh, my bishop, Bishop uh, Archbishop Jensen, uh, who is... Uh, my tradition was the Protestant Sydney Diocese. Very simple. No bells and smells. Very simple. <laughs> And, um, you know, I just know that they've, they've got it wrong. And mm. it's my duty uh, as a Protestant to try and persuade them that they're in error and to reform and to repent and to... <laughs> and uh, so I am protesting. I, I feel I should go to St Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney and nail up the 40 uh, uh, remonstrances on the door. Uh, maybe I'll do that to both cathedrals up there. But um, I don't want to exaggerate it, you know. I, I, I'm not a, a sort of super religious person. It's a private thing. I believe in secularism. I'm against the huge intrusion of religion into public life in Australia, a very bad step that's happened in recent years, uh, and it, it's been encouraged by successive Prime Ministers, and I'm again it, and I think it should stop. We should go back to secularism, which is the protection of everybody. Have you ever thought of going as far as what um, Johan councils that you should just forget about it and move on and get over the religion altogether? Well, Jan never really had a lot of religion, whereas I grew up with it. And you know, if you've grown up, at least in everybody, anybody's religion, whether you grow up in it, it is something very comfortable, it is something that takes your mind back to an earlier time, and in a sense a time when things seemed more sensible. I also happen to think that the Christian religion is a very loving and uh, encompassing religion, at least as I've always understood it. And so I don't want anyone to take those aspects away from me. In addition, in the Anglican Church, the Book of Common Prayer and the marvellous language of Cramner and the liturgy and the hymns and the whole thing is very, very beautiful, I think. And, and it, it helps in a spiritual feeling, which is an aspect of being a human being. Uh, we look on the television now and we see all these angry people all around the world doing things in the name of God or Allah. And it does seem very distant from the notion of loving one another. 
But that's the fundamental that I take from religion. But it's it's not something I, I want to... I don't want to say that, you know, I go to church every week and I'm down on my knees all the time and all of that. I'm not. But I won't allow anybody to take that aspect of my my existence away from me. It's not a part of Jan's existence. And in fact, he's very critical of it. And he says, you know, religions have always been horrible to women and to people of colour and to gays. Get over it. And they'll be happier if you leave them. And I'll be happier and you'll be happier in the end. But, you know, I don't want to do that. So we just have this very constructive dialogue about this and other things, such as my late conversion away from meat and poultry. He, he says, he'll get over it. That's just his latest obsession, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that sort of uh, attitude, that sort of nostalgic attitude for a previous time when perhaps things were, were much, uh, you know, a happy time in your life, for example, is that got something to do with your monarchism as well because that's been much remarked on and I just wonder if it, it's a similar sort of thing you're remembering back to the 1950s with the young queen touring and so on and what a wonderful time that was um, well I, I would have to say that I suppose it is I suppose there's an element of the certainty the stability I do think we in Australia are relatively lucky with our basic institutions, which probably means that fundamentally I'm quite a conservative person, as both you and AJ Brown have brought out. And I'll plead guilty to that uh, because, you know, I've worked within the institutions and I know they're made up of people, some of whom are lacking in imagination, but they're totally honest, they're not corrupted, they're working seriously, they're devoted to their duties, um, and uh, so if you ask, I'm not a mad monarchist. I don't believe in sort of uh, the Women's Day, women's, women's Weekly sort of image. But I think our system with an absentee monarch is a pretty good system. I mean, the fact that she's absent is uh, what I think is, a, <laughs> is actually a very good thing about it. Yeah. She doesn't come too often. She has all those lovely corgis to keep her busy in England. She comes when she's asked, uh, and she's never put a foot wrong as far as Australia is concerned. And, you know, when we think of all the horrible politicians or less horrible news readers we could have had as our president, uh, it's, it's not a bad sort of a system. It's, mine is a basically a, an anarchist's view of the head of state problem. Mm. It is, uh, it's a good system to have a head of state who stays away <laughs> and only comes, we don't have the stretch limos and the flag waving and the first lady or first gentleman uh, taking over as the symbols of the nation. I think that's quite a good system. Anyway, that's that's where I am at the moment. And if, if it does have something to do with that sort of nostalgia, though, can you see a time in the future, perhaps, when the Queen isn't there anymore, this particular Queen, that you might Oh, think... I think she'll outlive me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, it's, it's really not the person, though. I do respect the Queen. And I had the honour to meet the Queen at the, uh, when I presented uh, with others the report of the eminent persons group mm. on the future of the Commonwealth. And of course she's very devoted to the Commonwealth idea. And the Commonwealth's a bit of a problem because in 41 of the 54 countries of the Commonwealth they still have criminal laws against gays. Mm. So that's one thing that the eminent persons group recommended strongly should be removed not only for the equality reasons but also because hiv is twice as high in commonwealth countries as in non-commonwealth countries and part of the reason for that is uh, that you don't reach out to groups who are vulnerable to the epidemic if you criminalize them it mm. just stands to reason uh, so, um, seeing the Queen and seeing, first, when you actually go into Buckingham Palace, it's like a huge prison. And I've been to many prisons over the years, uh, and as a judge I was entitled to go to prisons and deliver the prison, as the, as the verb is, uh, to check on the prison. And as I came in I thought, this 
this woman, the Queen, lives her whole life locked up. And that's why what happened in the last week, you know, to uh, William and Kate was so very unfair. You know, they just can't even, as a young married couple, have a few moments to themselves, but a, a kilometre away is somebody with a camera mm. intruding. Every human being is entitled to a private space. And mm. uh, I think the sooner Australia adopts what has three times been recommended by the Australian Law Reform Commission, a tort of privacy for unreasonable invasions of individual privacy, the better. And if you look at the newspapers, of course, they're all against it. They're conducting a campaign against it. It'll be a very interesting question as to whether the government will have the strength and the, uh, the wherewithal to uh, approve and give effect to uh, protecting people against the invasions of privacy. In the light of what we now know has been happening over recent years, if we don't do it now, we'll never do it. Mm. And I think that will be a pity. I think there is a need. Everybody should have legal protections for their private space. Mm. Of course, I mean, I totally agree with you what you're saying about the Queen. In fact, I made a film about the Governor-General when William Dean was in that job and she came to greet him at Windsor Castle. And I remember when we were filming there, the first thing she said when she walked into the room, because I thought this would be a huge occasion, was, hmm, this is a small room, isn't it? And she didn't... So it was as though she'd been told, you know, go to room 56 in Windsor Castle and do this, and she didn't even know what the room was. Yes. Um, but it's a, an extraordinary thing to have somebody who is actually totally divorced from your society as your head of your society, though. That's the flip side of what you're it, saying. It's historical. <clears throat> and you've got to think about, can you think of something which will be better... But um, anyway, it's, it's something which will evolve and people go on magging about it and talking about it. And, and it's not a big thing. It's like religion and, and so on. Not big things in my... I don't lose any sleep at night. I don't toss and turn thinking, oh, sometime, somewhere, somehow, they're going to change this. No way. It's not a big deal for me. Much more interesting is the question of whether on the demise of the crown the headship of the Commonwealth will pass to the Sovereign of the United Kingdom because that happened uh, when India became a republic and King George VI became the head of the Commonwealth. And then when the Queen ascended the, the throne, Nehru wrote to the Queen saying, of course you will be the head of the Commonwealth. But the question will present itself very suddenly and very urgently on the demise of the Crown. And that issue hasn't yet been fully resolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's an interesting question, uh, but it'll be a political question to be solved politically quickly. But uh, that's, I think, uh, an interesting issue. But the other issues, well, we, get, we don't think too much mm -hmm. about the Queen because she's away, and that's a good thing. When you think of all the problems that the heads of state of the world cause, like um, Gaddafi and uh, even some of the presidents and alternate presidents of the United States, you think, well, it's a funny system, it's a weird system, you wouldn't invent it, but when you got it, um, an absentee head of state is not a bad idea. You were talking before about your work on the eminent persons group for the Commonwealth. <laughs> And there's no doubt that, you know, there were very significant issues that you raised there and you just talked momentarily about some of them. And yet it seemed to me that the media treatment of that was very dismissive and they treated it very trivially. Well, the media is dismissive of many things that are important. The media wants to only look at particular issues. The, uh, the Most of the media treatment of the Chogham meeting, where mm. the, the members, the heads of government were considering our report, were concerned with whether some disrespect had been shown by David Cameron towards Julia Gillard because he tried to imitate her accent uh, and, um, you know, things like mm. that. Mm. It's, it's like when they, they would cover the High Court of Australia. Now, I sat for 13 years in the High Court of Australia. I gave my all. I know that almost every day there was a very interesting problem. 
it was either a problem of the interpretation of the Constitution or interpretation of federal statute or a development of the common law. Now, they were a very interesting problem, but did you ever see any coverage of it? Virtually never. Uh, you, this is part of the lawmaking of our country and the coverage of it is pathetic. Mm. Uh, and when there is coverage, you know, you might see a cartoon where we're all sitting there with wigs which haven't been worn in the High Court since 1986. Uh, so it, it, the media doesn't serve Australia very well, I'm afraid, in this and other respects. Mm. But um, the problem is when you try to do anything about it, you're accused of interfering with the media and our basic problem is the media is owned by too few hands in Australia and we have to hope that that will change in time with the new media. As somebody who's spent a very long time, I think 35 years as a judge and very senior officer obviously and, and a very high profile public person, um, you have obviously felt the barbs that the media put out sometimes and particularly against you. And I remember interviewing Don Dunstan years ago now, and he said to me that he thought there was a, a project from the barons of the press to destroy people in public life from any side of politics, just in order to mean that all the power lay with the moneyed section of society. Have you felt that yourself during your life? You felt no, anything no, like no. that? No, no, I don't think that, that that is so. And in fact, you know, overall, over the <clears> years, <throat> I can't really have much complaint about the way the media has dealt with me, especially when I was in the Law Reform Commission. I depended very much on the media to engage the Australian public and to be getting people interested in and aware of the fact that citizens own the law and have a right and a duty to be concerned about the law and its improvement. I had personal reasons why I knew that the law has to be reformed and changed. So um, I don't think uh, that the media has, has sort of uh, just tried to uh, present um, the, the attitudes of, of the rich. I mean, of course, I have objections to particular aspects of reportage and the like. But uh, no, I, I, I don't have, I don't personalise this issue mm. at all. Uh, I think Don Dunstan uh, had a, a pretty good run actually when he was Premier and when he was changing. You know, South Australia then was the place to be, mm. and Dunstan introduced the first consumer protection laws, the first environmental protection laws, the first laws in Australia and state to get rid of the laws against gays, the first anti-discrimination laws. It was a really, and he got a pretty good run at mm. that time. It was when he came to Melbourne and he became the Victorian tourism. And he went to a book launch and he had somebody there uh, who was dressed in a nun's habit. Uh, that's when it was, at that time, mm. uh, uh, it, was, it was blown into huge proportions and, and I think that really damaged uh, him at that time. But in a sense, he was just launching a book. You never know who's going to turn up when you launch a book. I mean, there may be, <laughs> there may be a few nuns down the back here tonight. That's right. But, uh, we wouldn't worry so much about it now. Yeah. Well, uh, to be fair, that was in the context I was talking to him about Lionel Murphy and the things that Lionel Murphy had gone through in his life. And when you had your own issues with Heffernan, did you ever think about what had happened to Lionel Murphy and the horrible... Well, of course I did. and I, But I didn't think that this was a, a conspiracy of media against me. They were simply reacting to a senator of the Commonwealth who rose in Parliament and made accusations which I knew were false um, and which I felt sure, unless I was going mad, would be very quickly revealed as false. Mm. And... Uh, and as they were, in, within, I think it was 10 days, the whole thing was over. Mm. But uh, no, I didn't complain about the media. I did complain about the senator, but uh, he paid a price. I mean, he was sacked as a minister. He never again became a minister. Uh, and he apologised uh, humbly in the House. He used to come up when we would go to Parliament House to welcome a new Governor-General or a change of Prime Minister and so on, and he'd rush over and 
try to con- shake hands with me and uh, with my partner, Yeah, and I would always, being a polite sort of a chap, I'd always reach out my hand and shake hands with him. But um, Yeah, uh, how will I put this? He sort of lacks the hypocrisy of the Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> And uh, he, he, uh, on one occasion, uh, Senator Heffernan said, uh, won't you shake hands with the devil? And so he said, better the devil I know than the devil I don't. And he, he took his hand, but not very willingly and not very grace, graciously, I think. Well, it's a difference, you know. They're, they are not hypocritical people. They are very blunt. The people from the Netherlands, on the whole, they're, what you see is what you get. Yeah. Well, Heffernan is a very strange person, I can attest to that, because when I was doing the research on the book, he rang me at home out of the blue, and I picked up the phone and the voice at the other end said, it's the devil here. And I said, is that Bill Heffernan? <laughs> and I said, how did you know? Um, but uh, yes, but anyway, we'll move on from that, because it's not a very interesting topic, really, is it? The Heffernan business. Just to return quickly to the period when you were in correspondence with your your parents, um, which we detail in the book in the late 1960s. I just thought it was really interesting the different response in that correspondence between your mother and your father. And we can talk a little bit about your father's response, but I'll just read out this very short excerpt from a letter from your mother when she had read the, the letter that Michael had written to his father um, saying that he intended to have a gay life with, with Johan and that they are happy together and he was never going to leave Johan. I didn't quite Johann. say a gay life. I said I intended to search for love yeah. and uh, with Johan and well, so on. We will talk about that, actually, but this is what your mother's response was. Dearest Michael, I love you, I love you, I love you. No, I haven't gone mad. I just read your letter to Dad and we have just been sitting here quite silent, going over it in our minds, our memories of you as a little boy, as a baby, as a schoolboy, as a uni student, as a man. Dear Michael, we love you, we miss you terribly. It's very um, a very emotional thing, isn't it? Yes, my mother, as I said, was uh, was very intuitive very honest and um, she she showed her emotion my father was more controlled my father had been basically re- rejected as a little boy by his father and he was he was determined to become the father from central casting he was determined to be a good strong supportive father right to the end right to november last year he was um, in charge mm. and uh, he took no nonsense from his children uh, and he was an authority figure and he thought that is what a father is supposed to do. That is what I missed out on. That is what I was looking over the fence at the Kirby family to see all of them playing and uh, so on. I was looking for that and I will deliver that to my children. Mm -hmm. And he did. My mother was more intuitive, more responsive, more emotional. And uh, somewhere in life, I got a bit of both of those. You know, I, I, as a judge, I tried to be dispassionate, neutral, fair, and always courteous. Mm -hmm. I was brought up to be courteous and well-mannered. I never misbehaved. I always remembered that a barrister had behind them a client who was in the court trusting me to try to reach a lawful and fair outcome. Uh, But somewhere between that, between the emotion that engages the heart and is concerned about human rights and the dignity of every one of us, Uh, and the lineal, logical, authoritative um, way of dealing with a problem, as my father had, that's me. I'm there in between. Genetics is wonderful, really. DNA is wonderful. We are the product of these uh, two streams in our upbringing, and um, I was very fortunate in both of mine. Oh, look, thank you very much. That was just wonderful. And... 
You are pressed for time, I know, tonight. You have to get away soon. So we do want you to have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so if there are any questions, we, we'd love to have them. Yes, down the front here. Uh, again, thanks very much to the Wheeler Centre for organising this session this evening. Um, look, uh, there's plenty of people in the legal profession that seem to have uh, moral compass deficit disorder. Um, uh, if a, a lawyer naively helps uh, a friend to set up a slush fund and then subsequently finds that the friend has used it to misappropriate half a million dollars, is there a legal or moral obligation for the lawyer to report that to the police, uh, their knowledge of that, that matter? You also mentioned uh, Holland uh, and uh, the gay um, uh, free song in, in Holland. That seems to be on the decline. Is that a, uh, an issue that's of concern to you? Well, first of all, on the first question, it sounds as though it's getting a little bit close to a real life problem. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I know it's put presented as hypothetical, but you know I've sort of got very, very uh, strong antennae, and and I can sniff out a real life problem uh, pretty well. And I've gone out of the business of giving legal advice. In fact, it's illegal for me to do so because I don't have a practicing certificate and don't have insurance and you might sue me if I give you the wrong <laughs> advice. So I think I'll spare it. They're generally speaking, uh, in our sort of society, if, there, if a person is aware of a serious crime and doesn't report it to the police, that is what we call misprision a felony. If it's a felony, you have to report it. It's a citizen's duty. Now, that law may have been modified in Victoria or other states, so you'd have to look that up. But um, that's the way the law generally operates. Now, so far as the Netherlands is concerned, it is true that, like all societies, including our own, they go through a reconsideration of their policies, their policies of friendship and welcome to people of different faiths and, uh, and Islamic people, uh, and also their attitude to homosexuals. But, you know, the law, the Netherlands was the first country to enact uh, uh, op having, which is opening up. Op having. It's a wonderful word, actually, to open up marriage, to open it up. They enacted it in the late 1990s, came into operation at the first year of this uh, century. And it uh, is an idea which has spread, and no one in the Netherlands is suggesting that should change, and uh, it won't change. The Netherlands is a very uh, wonderful society, and I've basically lived in a Netherlands home for the last uh, 43 years, and it's a wonderful way to live. Everything's very clean, <laughs> everything's very neat, uh, and, you know, when Johan went overseas, he's in the Netherlands at the moment with his family, in the fridge, in the freezer, were 18 little packages of plastic with uh, containing my meals, for the, including one I'll get tonight when I go home. <laughs> Very ordered. Another question up, up the back there, yeah. Uh, Michael, Brian Keon Cohen. Uh, thank you for your insights. You mentioned a, a long career in the courts, 13 years on the High Court. I'm just wondering, amongst your many activities around the world in many spheres of creative work and seeking to make a difference, how did you find your time on the High Court in terms of being able to achieve the sorts of reforms that you have uh, battled for in so many different spheres of your life? Uh, putting it another way, was that, the, was that the best place to be to achieve the reforms or do you think you've done better in, in other places? Well, first of all, I, I pay a tribute to you, Brian Ken Cohen, because you were the junior to Ron Caston in the Marbo litigation, and you really played a very important role as a continuity uh, in that litigation. And I was talking to the students at the University of Queensland this morning about the High Court decision in Marbo and the great step that was then taken, which for 150 years our parliaments had not taken to recognise the uh, native title 
level of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I pay my respects to you. Was I as successful in the High Court as elsewhere? I don't think I was as successful as I was as Chairman of the Law Reform Commission. I think I was very successful there. I don't think I was as successful, and I know I wasn't as happy <laughs> as I was as President of the Court of Appeal of New South Wales. Law is such a hierarchical position. And in the New South Wales Court of Appeal, I was the president, and the the operation was much more congenial, and I think I had greater influence. But I wouldn't have missed the High Court uh, for quids. I mean, it was a it was a great opportunity to serve on a national final court, uh, and sometimes to influence decisions in directions which I thought were right. Uh, was uh, a very good thing. Commentators exaggerate the extent of disagreement, and, uh, but there, it is true and can't be avoided that I disagreed in a lot of cases. But that's how the system operates. Uh, after the son of Marbo, that's to say the Wick case, uh, Mr Tim Fisher, the Deputy Prime Minister to Mr Howard, said we must appoint capital C Conservatives to the High Court. And generally speaking, I think that's what Mr Howard did. I have no problem with that. That is how our system works. The elected government appoints the justices and they hope, against hope, that those justices will turn out uh, of a philosophical persuasion more congenial to them. That is our constitutional system. Uh, but you can get terrible shocks. Uh, the a coalition government appointed Sir William Dean, who is one of the most radical justices of the High Court ever. Uh, and uh, so uh, you, you can make big mistakes and, and judges are independent, so they don't necessarily toe any party line. Uh, would I have done better elsewhere? I don't know. I'm not so sure. But anyway, it was the right thing to do my best in the High Court and I served there and I respect my colleagues. They acted in accordance with their perception of problems and solutions. I acted in accordance with mine and that is what citizens expect from the judges of every court and especially from the High Court of Australia. Uh, Michael George Deftros, Deftros Lawyers. In uh, your analysis of uh, uh, various sectors and sections of society, do you think that we are not losing uh, sight of the bigger picture, so to speak, because shouldn't the emphasis be on the human rights of the individual, whether they be gay or straight or someone suffering from a disability, that uh, in somehow uh, compartmentalising and, and labelling people, uh, we are really losing sight of the bigger picture and that this ought to be the emphasis and perhaps uh, could be achieved by a uh, Bill of Rights that uh, is adopted nationally and, and enforced nationally and that this ought to be the emphasis that uh, we as individuals and uh, uh, commentators and uh, someone as... Uh, uh, forthright and uh, respected as yourself ought to be emphasising rather than just simply uh, labelling people and, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, putting forward their rights as opposed to uh, a person's overall human rights. Well, I, I certainly agree with, with the fact that we should have a Bill of Rights. After all, Australia is now one of the few, if not the only, uh, Western country in the whole world that doesn't have it and somehow doesn't feel that it's worthy to have it and that it can't be trusted with it and that the judges won't be entitled. I mean, the lie to the fact that Parliament will always fix things up is given by what I was talking about in Brisbane this morning. Uh, we had uh, democratic legislatures in Australia from 1856. Uh, uh, we are one of the oldest democratically elected representative parliaments in the world. And yet we hadn't fixed up the issue of the entitlement of the indigenous people of this country to have title and control of their own land. And so um, the value of a Bill of Rights is that it can sometimes be a corrective and can, advise, can help to call the attention of Parliament to uh, such defaults. And in the model that um, Professor Brennan put forward, uh, 
then the parliament has the last say. But the object is to stimulate the parliamentary process. I never thought that was uh, somehow derogating from the elected representatives in parliament. Uh, I thought that was something to stimulate the process. And after last week in Parliament, sometimes they need a bit of stimulation and a bit of a reminder of the basic principles of equality, of dignity, of respect, of secularism, of the rights of all citizens. I mean, last week it was all about faith, my faith, my constituents' faith and all this stuff. But the fact of the matter is that uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics shows that uh, for marriages in Australia, two thirds of Australians get married in vineyards. They do not get married in courts, in churches. Australians are not getting married in churches, they're getting married in uh, delectable uh, environments. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, what right have those people got uh, including people of, of, of my my faith to deny uh, other citizens who want to have that status. After all, 43 years, I mean, if you survive 43 years with another human being, surely you've put in your, your hard yards <laughs> and uh, you should have that right along with every other citizen to go to a vineyard or a church. <laughs> I don't, wish to, I don't wish to appear obsessed about this matter. And one of the things my father used to say to me right to the end was, don't get to be a Johnny One Note. There's a wonderful song in a 1930s musical. It's a Rogers and Hart musical. And uh, Hart was, of course, a gay man. And he wrote very, very sharp lyrics. And there's a song of Johnny One Night uh, Note. If I had a good voice, I'd sing it to you now. But my father said, you know, you talk about everything. Don't just talk about gays. But the issue of gays is on my mind because of this book and because of the rather uh, unpleasant events of last week when I think our nation could have done better. Um, Mr yeah. Kirby, forgive this rather light-hearted question amidst all these weighty ones, but... Uh, the mention of Marbo reminded me of a certain film and a certain vibe, and I'm wondering if you'd been on the full bench of the High Court when Bud Tingle was arguing for a man's uh, right not to be evicted on reasonable grounds and that his home was his castle, would you have come down in favour of Daryl Kerrigan? <laughs> Now, even though that's put as a joke, that sounds very like a real legal problem. <laughs> and there's no way I'm going to be trapped. But can I tell you, when I first arrived in the High Court, I arrived on a Friday night. I, after my appointment, I, we drove down there and I went up to the chambers, uh, which had been Sir William Dean's chambers, because he was appointed to be Governor General, and that made the space that led to my appointment. And I went into the room, which is, I think, the most beautiful of the chambers of the justices. It's on the front of the building, overlooking old Parliament House, new Parliament House, the Brindabellas, the official places in Canberra. But when I worked, walked into the room, do you know, I felt some good vibes. <laughs> I felt good vibes. And whenever I read opinions of Sir William Dean, um, they were exactly my thinking. It was as if our, our minds had been very similar and had uh, the hard wiring, which was very simple and similar. And I think uh, the vibes in that room were very good. So I believe there are secret vibes. There's probably also ghosts in the High Court <laughs> of all those past justices. I was the 41st, the 49th, Stephen Gaylor will be sworn into office on the 9th of October next. And 49 in 110 years is not very many people who've had the responsibility and the privilege to serve on that court. Well, on that note, if we could all thank Michael for... <laughs>